Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about ancient Greece. And for that I invited a very good friend of mine, Igor Silivanov, who has a serious crush and passion about history, particularly about ancient Greece. We're waiting for him to connect. Live Hello. from Italy. Hello from the Guria. Hello, my dear. You're in the Guria. There we go. Move. Let me just adjust a little bit. I think oh, my phone has had a little bit too much limoncello. There we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm ready to listen. I'm super excited. Here we go. <laughs> oh, the only thing we were supposed to lay down, right? When they were talking, <laughs> they had their symposiums. They were laying down, drinking yeah. wine, and talk philosophy and tales, right? Well, when you don't have TV, internet, um, or really anything else to do in the evening, obviously, you start <laughs> drinking. <laughs> That's what they used to do in ancient Greece. Yes. Mm -hmm. Laying mm -hmm. down, having their symposiums drinking wine and talking tales about gods and goddesses um yeah i guess that too I, i'm sure they did other things when they were drinking uh <laughs> okay what they were doing that's why i invited you tell us about what they were doing these people just stays for so long in the history of the humanity <laughs> um well um they were entertainers um they were they were usually women, but um, that was as that was as, as close as women would get to participating in this. Actually, uh, it's it's possibly not a very well known fact that all the ancient well civilizations of all that time, uh, probably the classical Greece was the last one you wanted to be born into as a woman. Uh, oh, but, to um, be born a woman? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. it would probably be not very well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, um, it was it was pretty bad, and we can get into that. I don't That's know if you want to start with that. that. Yeah, I would love to hear about that. So let's start. Let's start from the like the first um, talking about Greece. That there is this country. How did it happen? Because if, as, as I remember, <laughs> first uh, there was huge, uh, uh, powerful, uh, a huge place for ancient huge. Ancient Egypt was extremely famous. Everything was after the tradition of ancient Egypt, and then all of a sudden, Greece appeared from some from somewhere. How did it, how did that happen? Um, so it's important to uh, it's important to go through. I guess okay. So <clears throat> ancient Greece, as we know it, uh, didn't come about out of nowhere. Uh, it only appeared. Um, around well, around eight to nine hundred BC, mm -hmm. uh, Colette in a in a um, I guess a self awareness of the ancient Greece as we think about it. What was there before, however, there was a lot of stuff there before. So about um, eighteen hundred years BC, um, there was a, the a very prosperous uh, Minoan civilization on Crete. <clears throat> in fact, the picture that you used was me at Knossos, which is the uh, it is the prototype for the legend of uh, of um, uh, the Minotaur. It looked like the labyrinth, which is why, in fact, uh, Evans had called it the Minoan civilization, because when he dug it up, the Knossos um, castle or house looked like the labyrinth. So he called it Minoans after the Minos legend. Um, so they were, they have these dainty... Um, um, you, you mu everybody must have seen these. They have these thin, um, thin-bodied men with flowing hair that are very androgynous, um, and very colorful paintings. That is the Minoan. So um, they are very powerful. Well, they're not really powerful. They're artists, and they are, you know, they're not fighters. They're lovers, so to say. Um, they're not buried with any weapons. They do not have any walls around their city. 
um, they do not have any glorification of military prowess. Uh, this is because they're very good um, ship uh, sailors and nobody can contend with them. So nobody can even get there at the time. Um, then something happens. And when I say something, it is because we're not sure exactly what, but it is some combination of a natural cataclysm of which there was plenty. Uh, it's a very active volcanic area. So most likely there was a massive slide in one of the volcanoes, which caused the tsunami in the Mediterranean Sea, um, which um, um, I won't say wiped out, but heavily damaged their ability to kind of defend themselves. And they were conquered. They were conquered by people that are called the Mycenae, Mycenaeans, um, and which lived somewhere around Sparta. They lived in the Peloponnesians. These were kind of like the complete opposite. Uh, they built these massive walls um, called the Cyclopean walls. The ancient Greeks that we think of as ancient Greeks thought of them as the ancients. The Mycenaeans, the people that fought in the, in the Trojan War, as far as the Greeks were concerned, they were their ancestors. When they found these massive walls in the Peloponnese, they couldn't believe that people could build walls like these. So they thought that the Cyclops had built them. So they called them the Cyclopean walls. So um, um, they had conquered, um, they had conquered uh, Crete, and we know this because very, very suddenly um, there's a destruction level across 50 or 90 cities across Crete within 20 years. And then a writing system called Linear B, which is a derivation of the Mycenaeans, starts appearing in Crete, meaning that they took it over. Mm -hmm. um, around 1200 BC, um, something else happens, something very similar, probably a cataclysm combined with what the Egyptians later called, or not later, but they recorded it as the, um, um, the sea people attacking. Um, it's also called the Bronze Age Collapse, mm -hmm. which means that there were people that descended um, from kind of Russia, well, what is Russia now, uh, of all times, and for many, many thousands of years, uh, there were... Um, aggressive hordes of, um, uh, of, of people that had descended from the steppes of Russia to cause trouble for everybody else. The Mongols, the Tatars, the Avars, um, uh, there were others before them, and this was kind of something similar. They had destroyed every civilization along the Mediterranean, uh, going pretty much along the Mediterranean, the Elam, the uh, the Mycenae, um, the very powerful um, um, Hittite civilization was destroyed as well. And the Egyptians had fought them all. And actually, this is the culmination of the, the high point of Egyptian civilization. They were never able to recover from being attacked and, and uh, uh, here. And uh, even though they... Is this, is this people, was, was there Vikings some kind? No, no, no. They were... Um, so... The Egyptians actually named them. There were five tribes that are named explicitly. Uh, and I remember, uh, I remember one of them, two of them off the top of my head. One of them is the Palisette, which is, which is basically the tribe that went to settle in the Palestine, where, which is where the name comes from. The Egyptians say that these five tribes had brewed a conspiracy on the islands. That is how they put it. And then they fought them off, obviously, and, and beat them and destroyed them and blah, blah, blah. So um, uh, the Palisade, the, um, there's a derivation of the word Sicily, the Palisade or something like that. So these people had then went away and, and, and settled around Europe or the, the Fertile Crescent and so on. Um, but what happened to Greece is it was annihilated. Like within 25 there, the, there is a signs of damage or, or burning down the cities across the Greek peninsula uh, within nearly 20 years. So for the next 400, and, and they had forgotten writing. So for 400 years, there is no writing that exists uh, in Greece because why do you write? You don't write for, well, when you don't have anything else to do, you write for poetry and, you know, and, and what we think about literary books. But writing is necessary for bureaucracy. It is necessary to count your sheep, count your, um, you know, count your beans, to trade with faraway places, to do contracts. It is, that is what writing was invented for, 
And that is what, you know, that is why and what for the reason why it was developed. When you are barely scraping, eking out a living on the land, you don't need writing. So for 400 years, uh, from about 1200 to 800, 350 BC, there was no writing in Greece. And these homesteads that had survived, they had, they had learned to eke out a living by themselves. Eventually, they would, they would amalgamate into, uh, into, not cities, but maybe uh, um, into hovels and then bigger cities and villages and so on. And, and this is very, very important. Because this is a very different way than how Eastern civilizations or Eastern cities had, um, including, by the way, Russian cities, ancient Russian cities had come about. The way they came about is a king would come with, you know, 200, 1,000 men. He would build a central castle, or some equivalent of it. And then people would, would surround it because that would be their protection. They would build a city. In, a, in circles around it. Right. So there would be a natural hierarchy of power that would right. develop. Almost equivalent, you know, how close you are to the middle, both metaphorically and physically. Um, there was a very rigid structure, hierarchical structure, which is the very Eastern way. Greece developed, because of what I just talked about, Greece developed in a very different way. There were these seedlings that had um, come together willingly to, um, to be better than, uh, to, to, so that their life would be better together than long. It was a, a, um, a willing, um, will, willing coalition of, of basically first farmers and warriors, because you had to be both. And they would come together willingly and they would form these coalitions. And that is how the Western civilizations, as we know it, and our roots basically started. It was from necessity. You did not have kings that would protect. They, they, they eventually got kings, but very quickly got rid of them. And then very, very early on, you know, so it's some, some kind of prototype of uh, republic, right? Yes, yes, indeed. So it was, it was. Um, well, republic is a it, republic is a Roman prototype. construct, but it was a, it was a direct democracy. I don't want to get into nitty gritties, but it is a di direct democracy. Everybody, well, who's the landowner? Uh, which is actually not everybody, um, gets a vote. So um, it, it, the, but the concept of everybody being equal and the concept of democracy grew up from this period when they were nearly destroyed and the, the bits that were left had come together not under the auspice of some ruler, but, but as individual farmers uh, and, and you know, trying to survive, to come together to defend themselves. So that is kind of, it's important to understand that that is where they come from. And then um, on top of that, grafts on their, so in those 400 years, they're called the Dark Ages, but, you know, no Dark Ages are really dark. The dark age, they're called Dark Ages because nothing was written. However, a very rich culture of storytelling is developed. So um, uh, the Odyssey consists of uh, 15,000 words and the Iliad consists of 12,000 words. Um, there were men um, that would go around singing stories, that would remember the Iliad, the Odyssey, and many other things by heart. They would be, um, and they would be granted to entertain them. Because before the symposiums, when you're trying to eke out a living, this is fantastic entertainment. After a day of work, in the evening, around the fire, you come together as a village. Um, and you have it's someone singing you, yeah, you have someone singing you tales, you know, it's a show, exactly. And it also tells you your history, it tells you where you come from, it tells you how to behave yourself. It's like the Iliad is a, is a Bible for a civilized Greek, it was, because it told them how to act. It, it uh, proselytized values such as Xenos, which is, um, uh, you know, you have to be, um, you have to give shelter to a traveler that is in trouble before you ask anything. This is what happens to Odysseus. He's constantly pursued by a uh, vengeful Poseidon who destroys a ship or, you know, right. gives him trouble every time. And he's washed ashore naked and nearly dead. And every time he's picked up 
they, they wash them, they let them rest, and only then do they ask them questions. This tells them how to act. Um, and those, again, geography, like I was saying in the Egyptian lecture, very important. Greece is a very inhospitable place, geographically speaking, especially its shoreline. It is full of craggy rocks. It is full of very inhospitable sea. So sailors and travelers would meet, if they didn't meet their doom, they would be in trouble a lot of times. So it's very important they develop the sense of uh, xenos, which is natural, natural almost inbuilt um, cultural requirement to help travelers in, in trouble. Um, they have been given their language. So the Phoenicians uh, were master sailors. They took over from the Minoans and they were based in the land of Tyre, which is kind of, uh, it is where Lebanon and Israel are right now. Mm -hmm. um, they would form cultures, as, they would uh, rather uh, start colonies as far as um, Carthage, which is a, a Phoenician colony. But they would come to Greece, and much like Cyrus and Methodius to Russians later on, who brought Greek language, or not language, but Greek alphabet to oh. Russians, the Phoenicians brought the Phoenician alphabet to the Greek mm -hmm. who wrote, it down, wrote their language down in Phoenician language, replacing their lost linear A and B. And that is how the Greek language came about. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how it all got started. That's how I guess. Uh -huh. that's we probably find out about them in this stage. So uh, yeah. how, the, the, how the world was uh, constructed, what they were, were believing in. Did we, did Earth was flat with the three elephants or did they have any kind of vision? On the um, Besides, well, who ruled the world? Okay, let's go to, towards the gods then. <laughs> who ruled the world? Um, well, Zeus, Zeus ruled the world. Uh, that's easy, kind of. Um, <laughs> there, was a, um, there was a cosmog, a, a, a cosmogony, which is kind of the, um, it is the history of how the world began. Um, there were other, there were other, you know, gods or, or godlike creatures before them, but Zeus, uh, who, by the way, so all of Greek religion, it is not original. It is, it is borrowed from Egypt. It is borrowed from Middle East, um, and it is adapted to the local, uh, local life. I, I mean, uh, it is the necessities rather of local life, because, uh, like in Egypt. If you don't have any rain, you don't really need a rain gun, right? And even if you, you're just not going to borrow that from someone else. If you, <laughs> but if you do have inhospitable sea, if you have inhospitable, um, if you have constant uh, lightning storm, uh, and if your land is, you know, is very dangerous, that is what you're going to make your primal rulers. If you think about it, um, the primal rulers, the primal gods, and that's not just three, there's, there's many others. Um, well, there's about seven or eight, but the primal gods, the ones that are on top, first top first, of first the line, list. First line of gods. Yeah, first line. They are gods of nature. Um, that is Zeus, it is the god of sky and lightning. You got Neptune, who is the sky, or Poseidon, who is the sky, uh, god of, um, of sea. You have Hades, who is the god of earth. And then you have Ceres, who is the god of, um, um, uh, of harvest. It is, it is like, it's like the Maslow pyramid. You need to get, you, you need to, um, these are the primal forces of the universe you live in. Like Apollo, uh, god of, uh, god of um, the arts. You've got, uh, you, you know, you've got, um, You've got this secondary echelon of God who are their offspring. It is secondary. First, you need to survive before you have arts and love and um, right. all of the jazz. You have got to survive. And for, for Greeks, religion was about appeasing the forces of nature. Unlike, let's say, Christianity or even Egyptian uh, religion. Um, it wasn't, there was no... There was no um, salvation in religion. It is something you did. Um, your religion was told you what to do so that you got the hell out of the way and, and not gotten hit by light. It told you how to act and how to appease the gods. So you just get the hell out of the way and not get 
walled over by the very inhospitable world that they lived in. Their solace was found not in religion. Um, religion is full of very, it's full of morals, it's full of things, you know, you know it, it's full of fables where humans who thought too much of themselves got crushed. Uh, that's pretty <laughs> much the okay? I agree with you. <laughs> so it, it's, it's kind of moral tales of what yeah, not exactly. to do. To be simple. So, <laughs> Take off your um, ego. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is, it is, you are a little tiny dot in this universe. So don't think too much of yourself. Do you, think your seven, yeah, you think your seven sons and daughters are better than Apollo's? Well, how about I shoot them down with arrows? Right now. Okay, and make you good for Um, you think that uh, you, you can get to the bottom of things? How about fate makes you sleep with your mother unwittingly, father your children, and then and kill your father, as it was done to, uh, to Oedipus. Uh, and you live with that, okay? <laughs> so that's, what, that's religion in, uh, in, in big terms. It is not a pleasant thing. Okay? And, 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 and as you mentioned before, they were living around, surrounding by volcanoes, so those yeah. eruptions could have happened any time. So obviously they were ready and they understood that their life can end within next couple of seconds. Well, yes, but to be fair, volcanoes were the least of their problems. They lived in very inhospitable land surrounded by inhospitable people. Um, the Greek mercenaries for, for a very long time, very, very long time, I mean, up to the point when Greece was conquered by Rome, around 200 BC, for a thousand years, let's say, from 1200 BC to, uh, to, to 200 BC, Greek mercenaries were the best in the world. Egypt would hire Greek mercenaries. The East would hire Greek mercenaries. And they would fight each other using Greek mercenaries. That was like the stalwarts of their armies. Why? Because Greeks would fight each other more than anyone else. They would be very good at fighting, because they would just fight all the time, all the time. Uh, in fact, the Olympic Games were created as a break from fighting. So they had like whole schedule. Okay, so this is the, this is the time, the season to sow our crops. All right, we reap our crops. Now we will fight. Okay, now we, you know whoever survives, come back. You sow the crops again, and then you go fight. So fighting was just part of life. In, in Greeks. Uh, sure, Sparta was the best in the world, yeah. but everybody else was pretty That's good very at it too. right? Yeah. Like we would say, in today's world, people want to be, I don't know, actors, actresses, uh, YouTube celebrities or something. And back in Greece, they want to be soldiers. Well, want to be is, a, is a, it's not that they want it to be. Again, but geography is a very powerful fun. thing. They were, unlike Egyptians, so the Egyptians had the benefit of a buffer of a very inhospitable desert that would surround them and buffer them from the enemies. Egyptian armies were, were garbage. They, they were not very good. Whenever the Eastern, uh, Eastern armies, like from the Middle East, finally crossed into Egypt, they would crush Egyptians every time. They would crush Egyptians every time because Egyptians just didn't fight each other um, in earnest very much. They just weren't very good. Look, practice makes perfect. If you don't do it, you're not good at it. It's very simple. And the Greeks, because of their geography, because they were exposed in, in many areas, I'm including sure themselves, and again, because they had no kings mm -hmm. they, who could consolidate, you would have city-states that would always find reasons. They would make you know, a coalition would won, then they would scheme and this and that, and they would constantly fight. Again, it's very good for making fantastic soldiers and mercenaries, uh, but that reflected in their view of life and actually of afterlife um, and, and on religion. Their solace was philosophy. It is, it is um, I'd say that they invented, if you look, if you read their, book and you look at their pottery, you recognize that you start to see that um, they, um, they actually, for, for all their fighting, actually because of all their fighting, they did not glorify war. They knew it for what it is. Um, Ares, is, there are two gods of war. There's Ares um, and there is Athena. Okay? Ares is the god that has the least uh, altars to him. 
in the entire Greece. It is the, the least favorite god, the least number of altars. He was thought to be cowardly, bloodthirsty. Um, every time he would, you know, pick on someone, you know, he would pick on some humans. But when Athena came, you know, to confront him, he would get his ass kicked and run back to his father to complain about it. He was a cowardly, uh, bloodthirsty little god. And that is what the Greeks understood war to be. They knew what war did to people and, and how people became when they, when they were overcome with this bloodlust. Mm. Athena was not just a goddess of war. She was a goddess of wisdom. So there are two aspects to war. Again, war was very important to them. There is, a, there is an element of war which is heroic. It is the concept of triumph. So to say, it is the so the you know in Platonic terms the form of war was glorious and fantastic. The concept of you know of contest and, and this is where the Olympic Games also come in. It's war without you know people getting killed most of the time. Right. Um, but Ares, that there is an element of war which they recognized. They didn't just glorify war. They had the god Ares, and that reflected all the horrible things that war brought. If you read the Iliad, there's graphic uh, descriptions of what happens to the human body when it is hit by all sorts of weapons, like very graphic descriptions. There's a fantastic vase, which is in, um, um, in the British Museum, one of my favorite, actually. Um, so um, when the Greeks finally got into, you know, Trojan horse, blah, 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 when they finally got into Troy, Priam, who is the king, well, uh, king of uh, Troy, he hides himself in a temple of, I think, Athena, actually. And he hugs the altar, or he lays down on the altar. He enters a sacred place and lays down on the most sacred place of the sacred place. The word sanctuary comes from something like this. It means you cannot harm someone within a sanctuary. It is hateful to God when you do something like that. Mm. And... In the story, and I'm not Vaz, you have Neoptolemus, who is the son of Achilles, who by this time is dead, who is overcome by bloodlust. So he enters this temple, and Priam is surrounded. He's like a very old man. He's surrounded by his wife, Hecuba, and his daughters. So he grabs Neoptolemus, grabs a tiny son of Priam. And Priam had 100 daughters and 100 sons. He was very prolific. Productive. So... Um, he, he, he grabs one of his sons, his name is Astiax, and he beats Priam to death uh, with Astiax, obviously killing Astiax in the process. So, um, and this is, um, this is, Neoptolemus is a hero, he's a Greek hero, uh, and um, he does something that is thrice horrific. And uh, so Greeks, they saw people uh, as people, even their heroes, uh, if you look at Odyssey, look at the, you look at Hercules. You can talk about Hercules. Like, they were not perfect. They were not even close to perfect. Um, they were heroes in the sense that they were active and they took initiative and they tried to kind of impose their will on their on their uh, fate, which is ironic considering their fate was preset. But that is what what the hero was. However regardless of being here or not, they were merely humans. They were merely men um, as far as their okay, gods were merely men from that perspective as well. Um, so um, this is what they depicted. This is how they depicted their heroes, right? Which meant this is how they saw themselves. The they recognized. Yeah. So they didn't glorify either war or man. They saw things in a very real and and sad way and this view of the world this inability really to project well-being into any sort of eternity um or or forget eternity just just you know any number of a continuation of time what did, um, they, what did they think about afterlife what was happening afterlife so, um <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story, which I think illustrates it very well. Um, so Odysseus, um, during his voyage, he's told that he needs to go to the underworld to, um, to find the, by then, dead, blind seer Tiresias, who would tell him what to do. So he descends into the 
uh, into the afterworld, he um, uh, pulls, pours a libation of wine, and he waits for um, he waits for the spirit of Tiresias to come. Other spirits come about, and they drink the wine, and he talks to them. And one of the spirits he sees is Achilles, who's dead by this time, I guess. So he says, Achilles, you are the paragon of Greek virtue. Um, how do you find that being dead? And the paragon of Greek virtue says the following. I would rather be a live servant. And now to be a servant is even worse than to be a slave because a slave does not choose a slave, but the servant does. So it's worse to be a servant than to be a slave. So the paragon of virtue says, I would rather be a live servant than a dead Achilles. Um, this is how Greeks viewed the afterlife. Oh. Poor Greeks. So, <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, this is why. Uh, so, um, in contrast to the statues of Egypt, I just want to tag this on. The reason why um, you, you're going back to your original question about you know the Greek civilization springing up by the time it sprung up, which is let's say about 800 BC, which is when they wrote down the Odyssey, they wrote down the Iliad, uh, they created the Olympic game, they had a, an, a sense of what it is to be a Hellene, an Hellene. Uh, so um, by that time, the Egyptian civilization had, uh, had already existed for at least 2,000 years, and they had done sculpture for at least 2,000 years. The Greek took Egyptian sculpture at about 700 BC, they have the Kuru, which is like a, a boy sculpture, which is their beginnings. And then, now, if you think about Egyptian sculpture, it is very rigid, it, it, it's stationary, because Egyptians built it to represent eternity, because they did have a favorable view of eternity. But not the Greeks. Within 100 years, they will go from uh, Egyptian static staticity to what we think of Greek sculpture, with where they make the stone cry and dance and flow. Um, this is because to a Greek, the, the only portion of your life worth enjoying and thinking about and, 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 uh, and living, really, is the time between birth and death, which is why it is motion. It is when things are moving and changing. That is why they make their sculpture dance and live, uh, and, and Egyptians don't. So this is, again, it's, it's an it's a element of both their geography, which, which translates into their worldview. Um, that's, that's really all there is to the Greeks, the, the most important part. Mm -hmm. You promised to talk a little bit about women, why it was so bad to be mm -hmm. women at this time. So um, it is unclear why they developed a view of the women as they were. And it is important to say that this wasn't shared. This was, there was a very big, important exception to it, and that is Sparta. Um, and it is very interesting that Sparta, at the time of ancient Greece, was very much like USSR, uh, uh, let's say, in the 50s. Because if you think about the 50s, uh, a woman anywhere in the world is, is very, you know, it, it, she, she's free, but she, you know, she's tied to the kitchen and to, to you know, homesteads. Mm -hmm. um, she is taking care of the home and not much else. Um, not, not in USSR. In the USSR, you have true uh, egalité, so to say. You have women that is equal to men. Yeah. Um, uh, despite everything else and the totalitarian regime, um, there were a lot of things that were very, very progressive in USSR. Very much so in Sparta. Very much so in Sparta. In fact, a girl's education in Sparta up until 12 years old was exactly the same as, as, a, as a boy's. It's only afterwards that women mm -hmm. did something else, but men continued in the military. Uh, and they started very early, like four or five years old. There were stories where when a, um, a Sparta, Spartan army was away, Spartan men were away, some people or some other army had approached the Spartan city. It was chased away by children and women. Um, and that is how good their children and women were at the war. Okay? So, okay, but away from Sparta, um, think about the, 
so the first woman in 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 Greek uh, cosmogony is um, Vera. Um, no, Vera. okay. Very big, very big distinction to be made. There are women and there are goddesses, and those are two very very different things. Very different things. A goddess is a is a is something else. It is not a woman. It is a female god, so to say. Um, whenever you see Greek sculptures that are naked. Um, they're always going to be a deity, a goddess, a nymph, uh, something like that. You will never, never see a plain woman um, in a sculpture. In fact, you won't see a plain woman anywhere other than on a gravestone because that is the lot of a woman. Well, she's got two lots. Um, uh, she, uh, so a woman will be sitting on a chair and she'll be, and she'll be on a gravestone and she'll be accepting condolences. That is the only time when you will see a woman, another goddess, in, in sculpture, in, in, in Greek sculpture. So the first woman is Pandora. You remember what Pandora did? Yeah, sure. And it's her <laughs> she, released, she released all of those evils. There were no those evils in the world before. It is she that released it. So when you have that as the original creation myth for a woman, <laughs> you're not going to have very good feeling towards it. It's difficult to ascertain which came first, the myth or, right. you know, the um, original. Uh, or, but, but um, so a woman, so a few things. Uh, a woman differed from a child in ancient Greece uh, in one way. She could give uh, from a, from a um, legal point of view. The only difference in her and a child was that she could give testimony in the court. In all other ways, she was identical to a child, which meant she could own nothing. She, she, there was nothing that she owned. Whatever came with her as part of a dowry went to the man. If a man died, some, she always had to have someone uh, looking out for her or, or someone who would be an escort, whether physically on the street maybe, or in life. It would be her brother. It could be her brother. It could be a brother of her a dead uh, husband. It could be a father. It could be a father of her husband. The dowry would pass to whoever the man was. She did not have control over that. Um, a woman obviously couldn't vote. Um, if a woman was killed, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the person who would have killed her would be uh, in court not for murder, but for destruction of property, which is not a you know pleasant thing to be tried for, but you you know it's a big difference: murder or destruction of property. Um, a woman's uh, what else uh, should I say about women? She could not leave the house by herself, um, and in fact, oikos, so the homestead, which is where they lived, the the home. Uh, it's called oikos in, uh, in Greek. Uh, and the word economics is oikonomics. That is the woman lot. It is, the, it is to, um, to take care of the homestead. Everything in the house is under her purview. That is where she is you know, queen, so to okay. say. And that's it. So the word economics comes from oikonomics. Oikonomics, right? it's okay. management of the, of the house. In, in the and that is woman rule. Woman's kingdom. Uh, yeah. So that was the woman's lot uh, in, in Greece. In fact, um, really, the Greeks... Um, oh, another thing. Uh, a man's journey in life um, took him to be a warrior up until about the age of 30. So he's kind of busy until the age of 30. He could even become a, um, uh, a, sp a sponsor or a, you know, a... Uh, uh, a mentor to a young boy and teach him everything about life, everything that entails, including love and poetry and blah, blah, blah. And he would marry a woman um, for a single, for sole purpose of continuing um, his line. So there was no concept of family happiness, uh, really. I mean, um, it is, um, there is a, um, if you think about the Odyssey, it doesn't seem that way yeah. <laughs> because Odysseus does come back to Penelope. But exactly. I'm She's sorry. For him. He, he wants to go back. To he, him. Travels, he travels for 20 years, screwing all sorts of women, goddesses, nymphs, 
<laughs> sirens. <laughs> no, no, sirens. He listens to sirens. Yeah. He, he has all sorts of experiences, let's say, as they, as they would be called now. He has all sorts of experiences on his way home for 20 years. And his wife, the ideal of wife, uh, which um, Penelope is, um, she's expected to beat off suitors for 20 years waiting for her husband, even though he is probably dead, okay? So that was the lot of the woman, and that was the ideal woman, you know? And um, so um, uh, it is actually, uh, in, in, a lot of, in, in, in a lot of cases, the man that would marry a girl, really, would be 15 years older than her. Um, and he would be marrying her for the sole purpose of having preferably male children, obviously. So what, if you think about it, what kind of, what, what would they have in common? What would they, their, their mentality would be different. They would be at a different point um, in their experiences. And it, it is very difficult to imagine what kind of connection they could possibly have or at least from man to woman. This is why you go away and drink in a symposium at night for the most part, because women are not interesting. Um, well, their wives at least. I mean, there were, there was a cast of women, uh, us, who were a bit like geishas, and they were civilized, but that is a different thing. So that was a lot of women in ancient Greece. What happened to Greece? Why did it uh, get to the end of this? of its prosperity <clears throat> um, we know. well so internal strife uh, for the most part they um, the city state was a very good uh, a very good um, policy or not really policy but a good, a good um, way to, to be up until a point um, and, and obviously the ability to defend yourself <laughs> owned by fighting. But um, when they came against a force that was able to unify um, cities uh, as, a, as a powerful king or a leader does, which was Philip II, who was the father of Alexander the Great. <clears throat> He's the one that actually conquered Greece. I mean, he was a Macedonian. Now, the Macedonians thought of themselves as Greeks. But Greeks did not think of Macedonia as Greek, okay? So they were like these, they were like these people on the, on the side. They were kind of like borderline barbarian. They were the buffer between the, bar the real barbarians and, you know, Greeks. Uh, and um, they were kind of like barbarians. Like, Greek did not think of them as Greeks. But nonetheless, um, they, they did share Greek culture, and um, they were... Uh, Philip II was a very shrewd leader, and he did actually most of his conquering by politics and by bribing. And um, uh, and he had a saying: it was something like, um, "A mule laden with gold uh, is better at taking a city than than uh, like ten thousand men." So he would do that a lot. Um, he was killed by um, an, he was assassinated, and his son. Um, happened to be a fantastic military and leader, and um, this didn't happen very often when a when a very capable leader was succeeded by a very capable leader. Very rare occurrence because capable people are very rare, and to have them go one after the other is even rarer. So it was very fortunate. Well, fortunate. It was yeah. very um, fortuitous, so to say. Um, Alexander. Conquered the world, let's say. Let's do. Let's be brief. But he held it together by the power of his persona. And when it broke apart, when he died, it broke apart very quickly. And then um, again, it it um, um, there's a um, there's a cycle that happens. It's when um, when when life is tough. Tough men they rise up and they take control of this life. And they, they make it easier. Uh, they, when life becomes easier, tough men become soft men. And uh, it's very funny. There's a, there's a word called decadence that's used in Greece and for Rome as if there's something wrong with not wanting to you know, go out and murder 
and conquer territories and wanting to revel in arts and you know your accomplishments. Um, but that is what decadence is. You know, it, the war, the world. You know, the Romans became. You know, they they became decadent. Yeah, they stopped wanting to fight and wanted to drink more. Okay, so um, but this happens. This is a cycle. Whenever you get, whenever you you conquer and you and you taste the fruits of good life, you want to do that more than you know live in a tent and uh, you know and, and go fight. Um, and that's what happened to the Greeks, um, and then the Romans um, basically took them over. Um, they, they conquered them, but in conquering them, they were conquered by Greek culture. Uh, and it basically mm-hmm. passed on to the, to the Romans. Um, and that is how pretty much they, they didn't, the Greek civilization didn't end in a whimper. Oh, it didn't end in a bang. It, it ended in a whimper. And it didn't really speech, end. Right? It just got absorbed. It got absorbed right. where the culture became um, it, it actually took over the world. The Hellenic culture took over the world, whereas Greece itself shrunk into nothingness. So that's what happened to, to Greece. The physical place called Greece became irrelevant, but the Greek culture Mm-hmm. Uh, it spread around Your the world. Present, exactly. Absolutely. What do you think the the the, the best uh, the most significant discovery done done by Greece from your point of view by Greek? What do you like um, most about them? What makes you read about them, study them? Um, for me, not yeah, for the for Greeks. You, for what you. they no, no, for you. For you. Um, well, certainly, I would say that the Greeks invented critical thinking. Um, their philosophers, um, their, I'm not even talking about, like, even before Plato, uh, even before Aristotle, because they, they didn't just came up in a bubble. There were philosophers before them, the next Amander uh, and others. They were, um, they tried to make sense of the world, not by, um, mysteries, not by religion, not by cosmogony, but by observations and trying to reason out um, what they were seeing and, and how the world was constructed, not out of fear, I would say, but out of curiosity. So they didn't, they didn't believe in things so that they could appease them. You know, they didn't try to, when, when, <clears throat> When your crops fail, um, you can either do a rain dance, and sometimes it works, because when you do a rain dance, sometimes the next day it rains. Um, and you can live with that. Uh, and then it doesn't work, then you, you, know, you, um, you sacrifice someone, let's say. And sometimes that works. Um, <laughs> or you can try to, uh, which is very easy, it's really easy to dance uh, a rain dance or to sacrifice someone. It's really easy. What isn't easy, is to accept that the world is a hard place and to, um, and to try to understand it and accept things as they are rather than the easy way or how you would want them to be. Because then you could do eventually very, very difficult but powerful things like you know, genetic modification as we do now. Or, or other things, or combines, you know, or, or watering uh, systems. Um, those are a lot harder, and it is a lot, and it is, in order to do that, you, you need to have the curiosity and the wherewithal to try to understand the world, rather than say, I am a tiny little dot, um, and all I can do is a rain dance. If the gods listen, if I do it right, if I sacrifice my daughter, then maybe they'll listen. Um, I so think it's, it's actually it's, very it's, pertinent. It's, it's interesting a situation because from one side they were thought from very little age with all these tales and uh, mythology that they are little ducks and that they shouldn't even try. But then when we're looking at them, but probably it's coming from another side of uh, them conquer- conquering the whole world around them. So the kind of power comes within. So they have like... Yeah, but... So these two worlds collided. These two worlds collided even in their time. If you remember, Socrates was killed 
because he was um um how did they put it he said things hateful to the gods um right. effectively he was denying well he wasn't denying gods as is although some things he was saying he was basically <coughs> saying that the faith is is on ourselves not in the gods mm-hmm. kind of of sorts <coughs> he was trying to get people to think about things to 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 talk things out so to say and he was accused of of saying things that were hateful to the gods and they were actually very willing to let him go they they just wanted him to say i'm sorry he did not say i'm sorry uh he pushed them he kind of doubled down they kind of didn't have a choice they even they wanted him to escape just go into hiding go into mm-hmm. exile mm-hmm. he wanted that either no, um, so they had to kill him uh well ego or not he was very principled so to say i mean um when you're willing to That's die right. for your ego it's more than ego but but what i'm saying is that that was the first place like the these this you of of yourself as a of a speck in the universe where you cannot and shouldn't if you take uh, oedipus's lesson part shouldn't try to understand things you have a force that is pushing against that where you are trying to think things through i think it's very important actually in the world that we live in now when there's a lot of um um uh, this is called orthodoxy it's where you know thinking is frowned upon um and and a lot of rain dancing is expected um or or desired and questioning things is not uh, as as accepted as it once was um in our time um this is the same thing in in ancient greece um but they are the ones that kind of started it all they are the ones that started the questioning of orthodoxy and asking themselves uncomfortable questions where things weren't as they wanted them to be um but as they were and and seeing what they can do with it so that is what i like about ancient greek eager we have very little time left last question which one do you prefer ancient egypt or ancient greek greece uh, prefer... <coughs> what do you mean by prefer <laughs> Where would you love to live? Well, I I don't think I'd love to live in either of those places. Really? <laughs> um let, let's not kid ourselves. Um neither of those places were very hospitable places to live by our standards. Our world and people should appreciate this. The world we live in now is the most peaceful um disease free and um free and and a world where you can make choices that you want or as as much as is being said and and uh, around the world it is important to remember this is the best time in the history of the world to have lived and i am very cognizant of that so from that perspective i would not want to live i i love the culture of one and the other for different reasons but if you ask me where i'd like to live uh, here and now is very good fantastic answer <laughs> thank you so much as usual you did it <laughs> very interesting thank you so so much and i hope to do another one soon I okay i have an idea <laughs> talk to you very soon mm-hmm. thank you so much bye 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 my dear friends thank you so much for watching i hope you enjoyed as much as i did Love, peace, and equanimity. Have a great day.